Welcome to Fort Knox. I am John Ford, this time with Enrique Villamarin, uh, co-founder and CEO of Tool. Um, and uh, I, I want to dive right in and, and do as I always do, ask what's the toughest problem that you're solving for right now. But, you know, really interesting position where you're changing the way hardware stores um, you know, retailers get supplied in Latin America. So I imagine w with supply chain stuff going on with, uh, you know, boom and demand, there could be all sorts of problems that you're tackling. Yeah, I think we're tackling one of the biggest problems developing countries have, which is housing problem. Right? Bottom of the pyramid markets in LATAM are building their own houses. And, and this supply chain uh, uh, channel is pretty, pretty, pretty antique, pretty old fashioned. So we're trying to solve the main problem people have in bottom of premium markets in Latam. Um, how are you doing that? Give, give a sense of the, the way things have been done in the past as far as how materials get in uh, to the places where people can resource them, to, can, can reach them to, to build their own houses. I mean, we hear about the prices of lumber going way up and that's if you're shopping at Home Depot or Lowe's exactly. in the U.S. It's got to be a whole different situation. Question: If you can even get supply in a developing country, and then how much you got to pay for it if you're buying it in small quantities? Yeah. So these small mom and pop shops in Latam basically account to sixty percent of the of the supply chain channel, right? So if you if you if you if you would if you would sort of map out how materials flow from production companies, right? say what steel cement paint whatever how do these materials flow through the supply chain channel right 40 percent would flow through an established formal construction company like you would have in the us right and 60 percent will flow through these shops right so basically most of the construction is flowing through these shops how do these shops buy or how do these shops buy before tool came into the market they usually bought from between 25 and 40 suppliers. And that's how they, that, that's how they procure to the store, to the store right? So at, at 8 a.m. in the morning, supplier A would come and offer them brand whatever of paint at 8.30, supplier B. And what so like, all day long, all suppliers are coming in, offering them offering them stuff, right? And what's even worse is if you, if you figure this out, 25 to 40 trucks would be arriving to that store in the next three or five days, right? So what we're doing here is, is just making all this supply chain much simpler, right? You can buy everything to one simple place. We would take that one single chuck in terms of logistics into your store. So it's just before we came in 200 years ago, it's just we're being working the same. It's just pencil and the paper, the mm. supplier comes into the store, you buy from that guy and, and, and no, a truck arrives three days later. And we just sort of solve or make it much more efficient the way we work in that sense. Well, it seems like layers of, of challenges then. If they're used to working with pencil and paper, yes, it's antiquated. But if it's what they're used to, how do you switch to a different client experience? Is it the phone? Is it a PC? What's the broadband situation? How does comparative shopping work if you're using a small screen, which so often is the dominant form of computing in a developing country? Like, how do you do that in a way that that's a good customer experience? Yeah, that's that's one of our greatest hurdles. Is exactly that. I think you're tackling a great point. PCs in this bottom of the pyramid, like sort of economy, doesn't work, right? People have their phones, right? And 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 usually startups in LATAM sort of tend to, to target the high income sort of people in LATAM because it's, I think it's, it's much easier because they have credit cards and what so forth. Our target is a seven year old guy, 65 year old guy that has managed a business for the last, whatever, 40 years. And has managed it, as you said, pretty, pretty okay with a notebook and a pencil. And now we tell them, this is a better way to do your business, right? So we're, 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 we're getting into his phone, which is a very private sort of place he has, right? He has never bought through an app yet. He doesn't know what an app means. He has maybe WhatsApp and that's it. So we're trying to tell him this is a better way to do business, right? I always tell my people this is like a, like a DVD Netflix analogy, right? They, they know how to go to the blockbuster issue and now we're sort of giving them a, like a more convenient way to do it, right? So we're telling the guys, you know how to run your business. You've been doing it marvelously well for the past four years. This is just simpler, right? Try to, try to, try to, Try us out, right? And, and we're going to help you 
in the first six or seven purchases. That's 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 how much time we spend with these guys. We would sort of sort of walk them step by step on how to buy through the phone, why we're not sort of a, a scam company. It's going to work, right? So we have many sort of layers. For example, uh, he doesn't have to pay anything until the truck arrives. So now he starts saying, okay, fine, I can order through these guys. I don't have to pay right away. Once I see my truck outside, I see the, the merchandise outside. Now I can pay. So it's all sorts of sort of uh, uh, triggers we do for him or her to be just more comfortable the way they use this new technology, right? If the store has a younger sort of nephew or daughter or whatever running the store, these guys now come with a, with a, with a smartphone not, uh, tied to their hand. So it's much easier to, to convey the message when, the, when that happens. Now, uh, th that was going to be my next question. There's a couple of them. One is, to what extent do you need an on-the-ground advocate for the technology and for the model? And if, yeah, there's a nephew or, you know, a, a, a family, other family member who's younger, who's used to the technology, hey, uncle, I do this all the time. You know, this is how I buy my books or whatever it is. That's probably a lot easier. But what if they don't have that? Do you, do you need or have an on-the-ground sales force to kind of create that channel and be trusted? And then payment. You mentioned that um, not everybody's got credit cards. So is it payment on delivery? How does how does cash become a part of the digital economy if that indeed is what's happening with some of these customers and stores? Yeah, beautiful question. So 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 number one, yes, we have two sort of onboarding processes, right? One is like an on ground a, a force a, a just walking through the neighborhoods, right? So what, how do we do this? We sort of map the neighborhoods out with a, with a guy in a motorcycle and a GoPro, just mapping the neighborhoods out. Once we know how many stores are in the neighborhood, right? Then we sort of send a hunting team, that's what we call it, a hunting team to these stores, right? And we sort of try to convey the message that, that you know, download the app, it's much easier to buy through this app or whatever. Once that person has downloaded the app, we sort of start hitting him with sort of a, a, a digital a, a message, right? Where we start pushing messages through his phone and start also a, a, with, a, with a physical guy on, on, on the street, right? Once we see that person is responding to these, to these online messages, to these digital messages, we start sort of removing the physical person. So that's, that's how we do it. We basically do the door-to-door the, the -door sort of knocking and, and street basis uh, uh, onboarding now we have around 30 percent of the onboarding done digitally which is great i think it's a, it's a word of mouth sort of deal now these guys are talking to each other and now they have downloaded the app by themselves and so so the beginning is with 100 sort of onboarding physically and now we have like a 70 percent onboarding physically right that's that's sort of point number one and point number two which is a very very sort of big issue in latam is cash right as you, you said it perfectly right we have we started with 100 percent cash we're 95 percent cash and cash is an issue right as i say cash is king but i say cash is not king where you're in you know, 8 p.m bottom of the payment neighborhood in latama favela it's not easy to manage right it's hard so one of our one of our one of our of our solutions with the app is now these guys have a sort of an e-wallet with us now these guys can order a mpos reader through the app, we would put that MPOs, MPOs reader in the in the in their store. So whenever someone comes into the store and sort of reads, or pays with a with a credit card, they will have this sort of bank account with us, right? Now we have these QR codes that whenever someone comes into the into the into the hardware store and pays with a QR code, now they have the wallet with they have the money within our wallet. So we're trying to make a whatever two thousand euro problem, which is having cash. In the bottom of the period, trying to start to utilize those payments and make it much more online. But yes, it's it's 95% cash-based system. We have all sorts of all sorts of tech on how to recollect that cash. Because if, if if you figure this out, we have trucks moving around town with merchandise, and then we have trucks moving around town with cash, right? So we need to be able to have guys on bike sort of onboard those trucks and sort of uh, remove the cash from them and go. To a bank and, and deposit so it's, it's sort of a, a very sort of tech scheme that that we play around every day to to solve the issue but in the long run we we we, we were willing or we want to push for more digital payments on these stores are the wireless carriers 
on your side here. It, it seems like a massive opportunity for them where, um, so in the US, for example, as software platforms get more advanced for e-commerce, things like that, people's phones and PCs are also getting more advanced to be able to handle um, the, the increased load and demands on software. But I imagine um, in a lot of developing markets, people are keeping their devices for a lot longer. Uh, they're not necessarily, it's not necessarily in the, wa in the culture to be like, oh, well, I'm going to get the latest app. You know, once you get somebody off a of pencil and paper, they're sort of like, well, this is my app and this is how I do it. I don't imagine they're going to take too kindly to, a, to an interface upgrade, right? So it, it would help if you had somebody subsidizing the equipment, you know, a sales force that was in there. And, and it could even help with digital payments. But is that likely? Is that happening? The quick answer is no, it's not happening. We're developing it ourselves, right? We're, right now, we are developing the tech to not only help these guys procure for their stores, but the next phase is help these guys run their business, right? So we're, we're now, we have already sort of run the pilot to sort of create this, I'm not going to call it ERP, but sort of a POS system where these guys can start sort of having a ledger and a simple ledger, right? They've never had this before. So if they now log into the tool app, they can now procure from us and then they can sort of put how much they sold and very simple steps to take them into a very sort of, yeah, simple ledger sort of start making the business much more evolved. But yes, it's not happening as a, as a, as a separate company. We're doing it ourselves right now. Well, a huge potential impact, not just in, you know, hardware stores and materials, but overall the economy and digitization, um, you know, as you work on making that happen. I want to talk more about your vision and the progress that you made so far with Tool, but uh, before that, now I want to go back and uh, get a sense of your backstory. Um, so I like to start at the very beginning. Tell me about where were you born, parents, household, siblings, what was the situation? Amazing. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. I lived in through 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 my early year in my early years here in Bogota, Colombia. I have one brother uh, who also founded a very sort of successful company called Rapi. So we we come from this sort of uh, background, right? We we like to we like to sort of uh, discuss problems in the economy and in, in, in our in our dining table and sort of sort of try to solve them uh, as we could. So yeah, uh, one brother mother and father, both very into the corporate world. And I went to study economics in Colombia and then went to do an MBA abroad in Spain, came back to Colombia and started you know, working in one of the biggest sort of construction conglomerates there is in LATAM, right? Now we're moving too fast. I like to spend more time right in, in the childhood just a bit to understand. So you, you said um, your parents very involved in the corporate world. What did that look like? We're talking like 70s, 80s, what, when are we talking and what are they doing? Yeah, my mom was was big into oil and gas, right? Uh, and there's, there's a funny story, which is that she actually went to, to, to sort of sell uh, oil and gas abroad. That was not 80s, late 70s, 80s, right? And, and Colombia wasn't in the map. Colombia was you know, one of those countries that was, where you come from and what are you selling? And, and she had to actually go with a physical map, like a physical map to whatever, to Japan and to, and to, and to whatever, and sort of explain what Colombia was and explain one of, that we have one of the biggest oil reserves. So she was really corporate in that sense. She worked for these big uh, corporate sort of oil and gas companies, right? And she sort of set the basis for the family to, to, to understand what sort of responsibility means, what sort of, you know, and she was traveling all the time. So, so it was sort of having that mother, which was being a mother, but sort of being a mother from abroad, being a mother from, from the outside and just telling us what work means, right? What, what waking up and going to bed 9, 10 PM and just putting the hours into, 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 a, into, into a problem does, right? There is no quick money, right? You need to just work it out. My father, on the other hand, he worked into, into he, was, he, was, he was always, or he's always into finance. He's been into finance for his whole life. And he actually, in the, in the, in the past 15 years, started his own company. So he was corporate before, it was in the banking m &A sort of industry, and then sort of created this boutique sort of m and a, 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 a yeah, firm. And he's been running that for the last whatever, 15, 20 years. 
and yeah, so we have sort of the, the, the both angles, right? We have we have a person that my dad was corporate, and then become more much more entrepreneur, and we have my mother, which was complete sort of corporate person. Uh, but yeah, complete working family. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. And my brother and I, uh, my brother is younger, and and he was much more into tech than I was at the beginning, and 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 yeah, he he sort of pushed me always to to understand much more of this tech world and the benefits of understanding how tech had disrupted sort of the, the developed the developed countries and how could we bring that tech into latam and understand better uh, how do we solve problems with tech right what was your first uh your first dipping the toe in with business maybe even as a kid it sounds like you had uh, business and entrepreneurial ideas all around you so you, you must have been selling something <laughs> yeah uh, uh, we were selling sort of a, 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 a I call it like like a alcohol or whatever yeah a, a alcohol and, and cigarettes in the in the in the um, in college so we had this sort of number that people call us we were always in college sort of spreading this this number around people called us at whatever 8 p.m and wanted whatever they were in the middle of the party wanted a, you know this a liquor or whatever and we just took them to them so that was the first venture I was. Um, the next venture uh, we had was with one of the one of the one of the co-founders. He's really into tech, and, and we were sort of uh, understanding how could we bring could we bring tech into logistics, right? So he he developed this sort of uh, RFID sort of logistics tracking with with it, with, with with warehouses. So yeah. We, we developed that a, a, a long time ago. So I've been more or less dipping my toes into, into an entrepreneurial world. Not like this. This has been you know, full splashing into the water and just swimming with the sharks. Different than the, the past. You know. What did you think you were going to be when you were growing up? That's a great question. I think I always envisioned myself owning, owning my own company. Um, that in Latam is not easy because you, you, you don't have you don't have funding, right? Funding is not as easy, I think. And I and I really want to say this: Rapi sort of opened the world to many sort of VCs to open to to come into Latam and to come into Colombia. But it wasn't easy. So I always envision myself sort of running my own company, right? A life takes you to a path that that you cannot decide. So I had I, I got married at thirty, you know, ha, ha, have two beautiful daughters. And, and, and I think when, when you most sort of, when you most see the need to go and you know, go and get that sort of bread for your family, that's when you sort of not dip your toes, but sort of plunge into the water, right? That, that was my decision-making process was, okay, now I have two daughters. One is whatever, one was six months old, another one was two years old. And that's when I decided to, to be an entrepreneur, which was a weird moment. But I think that has been like my biggest sort of push every day is you not know, to get to get to my house and just see those daughters and just keep on pushing. So I think you need to have a motive to, to do this, right? Because it's, it really is hard. It's a hard, it's a hard sort of, yeah, a time, timeline. And, and you need to have that motive to, to keep pushing. What was your brother's trajectory? Because it sounds like he was a little bit more into tech um, sooner than you were. You said, did he also take that entrepreneurial leap sooner? Yeah, when when I was really good friends with Simon, uh, the other co-founder of Rappi in college, right? So so when so we have we are, we are very good friends, and when my brother sort of graduated college, uh, yeah, we sort of met, and I told Simon. Hey, this is my brother. You know him. He's into tech. Why don't you guys you know start? He, Simon already had a company. Why don't you start talking to each other and see if there's something there? So my brother pretty much sort of graduated college and then sort of went into the entrepreneurial world right away and has a very successful company. So so I think my path was much more sort of corporate, understand what I wanted to do, and then move to entrepreneurial world. Yeah, and I think when I always talk to VCs, I think in the B2B business, you really need to know. About your your industry, right? It's not it's 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 really sort of having that deep knowledge on how the industry works, and 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 just push through, uh, know the pains of the industry, right? So so I think that path that my life took me uh, with just knowing that corporate world, knowing that how that structure world, 
knowing how construction world uh, works, I sort of then moved into the entrepreneurial business. But yeah. Tell me about getting to know the construction world. What, what was your experience? Were you directly involved in building something or um, how did you learn? I supplied, I, I was the biggest supplier of cement for, for Colombia and Caribbean and part of the US, right? So, so I did the supplying, right? So I, I, was, I was sitting down in that sort of sexy table, uh, suppliers, you know, big headquarters. And, and I was supplying to all these stores. And, and once we had sort of this, this, this big fair or whatever, and, and we had this big stand, this corporate stand, and these two guys came into the stand and they, and they were these hardware store owners. And they said, could we have a beer? And I said, sure. And they said, why don't you sell cement to me? And I was like, what do you mean? We do sell cement to you. And he said, no, you've never seen in my life. All you see is distribution companies. You push product to them. Have you never seen him? Why don't you go to my store and meet me and know my name and who I am? And that sort of hit me really hard. And and and, and yeah, so in the construction world, it's 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 a beautiful place, right? But it's it's as if you if it's, it's if you sort of walk over you know, a mountain and you and you, and you hit this valley full of dinosaurs, that's construction, right? It's just big animals that haven't moved a lot in the past two thousand years, comfortable animals, right? And, and 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 the sexy part of the chain is is upwards towards the production companies, but where the magic happens, which is in the market, no one is looking at the market, right? Or everyone is looking at these corporate guys, which are they have built amazing companies, and I don't want to sort of they have built amazing companies, but these bottom of the pyramid neighborhoods need their help, and they need to, yeah, and and they've never seen them. All they see is a truck and a, and a warehouse and just push produce whatever PVC and just push it across and push it across. So that's when it hit me. And, and yeah, there's a big, there's a big gap, a big need in the market there. So where did you go for funding at first? Um, Cause you talked about there isn't a, a, a huge legacy of venture capital in LADAM itself. So you got this idea, you got the motivation, um, pretty recently married, two daughters. Hey, I'm going to go out and take this to another level. But how do you do it? And that was that was just two months before COVID. I'll, I'll tell you that story later. But yeah, how do I do it? And basically, going to the to the early founders in Rappi and telling them, guys, I would I want to pitch to you guys, right? And and these early founders in Rappi sort of knew the ecosystem, knew my brother, knew Simon, we were friends, and just try to pitch them. So we had like really angel investors in Colombia, but fortunately I could get these couple of US based firms, right? Like Vine, like H20, that those guys sort of were the, the, the later on sort of bridge to get to the US, right? So I had these angel investors that I had invested in Rappi and had sort of were comfortable in the BC world. But for, I was really fortunate to get to these couple of funds that were based in New York, that they knew the market, and they taught me about BC. And so I had like the, 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 the dual sort of side, a very angel uh, investing and sort of more professional sort of BC world. But I did it with just connections with, with a Rappi sort of uh, cloud. Um, what was the reception at first? What were the skeptical questions or, or eager questions that you got? Uh, I had one of the one of the biggest questions. Why was this has to be the least sexiest business I've heard about in a long while, right? People are talking about you no know, AI and just different stuff, and you talk about just going back to basics and you no, know, and and going to what people sort of nourish, which is a their house. And yeah, so the, so the questions was why has no one seen this before? right uh, how come you guys are starting this and we have no sort of comparables across the board and that was a that, that's a question that always sort of is in the in the in the in the what was before in the in sort of the, in the in the table how are you going to convince these guys which was your previous question you no know, seven year old guy who has been successful through his life to leave his notebook and start an app right uh, and how are you going to convince these producers right these sexy guys that have been making a lot of money in the previous 200 years to start moving product through your through your app, right? And and, and not through their 30-year-old sort of uh, network they have been 
doing it? Those, those are the big questions, right? And, 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 and yeah, it was just, I think if, if you have, if you have a company that you start with, with a, with a, with a, with a mission, right? Like with a, with a deep mission, right? Now, a deep mission is really to transform LATAM and, 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 and from the, from the roots up, right? We're not sort of, uh, playing with the top of the pyramid, we're playing with the, with the roots of the economy, right? And, and, and I think that mission sort of conveyed the message. We said, guys, we need to tackle this problem. This is the biggest problem in our time. People don't have a house to sleep on. People are building their house with their own hands and people are asking, ask, 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 or, or getting materials from the store very costly, without finance, without any knowledge, right? And, and, and when, for example, the lateral disasters happen, like for example, when it, when it shakes in Mexico, Mexico falls and, and it, it, Mexico doesn't fall. Bottom of the pyramid neighborhoods in Mexico fall, right? So it's, it's a poor people again, suffering these disasters because they build the house with, with their own hands. So, so it's just tackling one of the biggest sort of neural problems we have in Latam. I think that was a, sort of the, what, what broke many, many sort of VCs to, to, to better us. I, I bet it was a challenge when some of the investors understood that your base is, I mean, not all, but some like 60 and 70 year old shop owners. Because so often we talk about LATAM and people are making the investment case. They're like, oh, look at the youth market and look at how big, you know, the market of young people is going to be. And I want to put money into that. You're talking about the financial and technological infrastructure that all of these other opportunities can be built on, but it can be hard to get people excited about what what needs to it be is. done it is it is it is it is it is hard to get done and i think that's 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 why that's why no one wants to get their hands dirty with this sort of population and an older population right so so i think i always tell the people here in tool when i do these town halls you know remember when cab drivers in colombia or whatever in mexico had this sort of radio walkie talkie whatever i know how to call it right and, and, and you should call, you know, you call the cabs, whatever. And now they have four or five apps just running through their, through their cab, right? That's what we need to do, right? That's, that's, it, it, it takes time to do this change, right? But it's inevitable, right? It, it, the, the industry, I think, and I don't get me wrong, but I, one of the biggest industries in the world that hasn't been tapped with tech is construction, right? You see these neo banks, which are tackling sort of the financial sort of sector. You see, you no. Know, Tourism has been sort of completely reshaped with tech. Construction, as I told you, has, hasn't been touched. It's coming, right? It, it, we're, we're sort of the, the tip of the iceberg in that sense. It's coming. And we need to keep on pushing because we need to break through these paradigms, as you say. And, and usually it takes a while for this 70-year-old guy or 60-year-old guy to, 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 to hear you out. You know, what's, you know what's nice? That when you get to that store, that guy or that, or, that, or that person tells you, I'm not interested, right? I've been running my business, okay, I'm not interested. Why? Because they are the, the architects of the neighborhood. They are the engineers of the neighborhood. They are the, they are the banks of the neighborhood, really. They are, they're lending people money, right? So they know it all. It's one of those like, grand, like grandpas that you, you ask him whatever question that he knew the answer. Those are those guys in the neighborhood, right? And when you approach them with tech, they don't want to feel stupid with their sort of the community. So they say, no, right? No. But if you manage for them to download the app, they will start sort of fiddling around with the app on their lonely on their loan time, right? Not, not exposing themselves, right? And if you manage for that guy to buy six or seven times, then they quickly change him, become your ambassador, and say to the neighborhood, guys, I use tech. You're a, you're a bunch of old guys that don't use it. So it's, it's it's a matter of just trying to help them out. Don't expose them for them to be sort of uncomfortable with it or not. So try to help them out, right? And once you're there they can see the sort of the, the you know, the, the profit of you in doing this. And that's why you have a high retention rate. We have over 70% retention rates because when we impact those guys, if, if we sort of break that sort of barrier, then they stay, right? That's uh, one of the best examples, I think, of the importance of culture and understanding it, right? You're talking at the street level, here's how communities work. Here's the importance of a small business owner, the authority of a small business owner who sort of knows the families and therefore is willing to lend because, you know, even if if that person doesn't pay, then they're 
aunt or uncle is going to pay because they have an account at the store and have for generations. That that's kind of what you're talking about, right? That's what we're doing here. That's what we're doing is here is giving this guy a better way to buy, then giving giving this guy a better way to run a business, and then with that knowledge, with that algorithm he has in his head, as you said. No, John is good, is good for the money. That guy isn't. We can lend him money. We, we don't want to lend her money, right? He knows his neighborhood, right? And having that knowledge with tech, now we can push a fintech model to the to the end of the end, end of the, uh, the end consumer, right? And just tell him, okay, now we're gonna start, we're gonna start giving you the, the possibility of you lending money or bigger amounts of money to your neighborhood. You've been doing this for a while with a small, a small amount of cash. I can help you out because you know your neighborhood will can help you out with some cash. We can help you out with a two rental business, right? Now, sell the merchandise or sell the, the SKU, sell, the, sell the, um, the product, but also you can rent out the tools. So now we're helping the community with better tools, better sort of finance, leveraged upon his, his knowledge of the neighborhood, right? I think it's arrogant. I think it's respectful if you just go to that bottom of the neighborhood and start pushing through, right? You need to know how to get there. And one big step is these hardware store owners one big, one big step is trust with his neighborhood, right? And so, so, so just get with him, you know, get, get that transaction going, him buying you SKUs. Once you know that guy, get into his store. Once you know his store, get into his neighborhood. That is sort of the way we, we walk through and, and, and the way we plan to improve these neighborhoods in Latam. It's really rethinking the, the whole channel model, it, it seems, and empowering um, a, an important piece of it that was just sort of sold exactly. to in the past. That is our main point, right? The channel, the construction channel has been thought of factory downwards, right? The most important guy in a steel company is the right, the, the guy that runs the mill, right? So, so it's been thought of, no, just push product down the line, just produce and push, right? It's commoditized sort of, sort of, sort of industry. If you start thinking in market upwards, right? And you start understanding what are the needs of that market, and then telling the factory, hey, guys, I'm seeing this, right? This is what happens when it rains. This is what happens when it doesn't rain. These people are buying like this. Now start producing SKUs within your factory that sort of address those needs. Don't, don't produce how, you, how, how you've been producing for the last 50 years. You know, when, when, I got, when we got to, to Ecuador, the rebar, right, is around 40 feet long. When it got to the, to, the, to the steel company, I told them, guys, why are you producing 40 feet long rebars, right? A house is 12 feet high. Who, who's building a house 40 feet high? And they said, well, I don't know, someone has to cut it. And I said, what do you mean? I said, no, you only care about your factory and your districts and not about the market, right? And, 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 and that's, that's the way we're trying to push this industry and say, guys, the importance here is the market, is understanding how these bottom up payment markets work. How do they buy? Why do they access finance? How do they access finance? and then push the needs to the factory. So that's, that's sort of the big sort of turmoil we're, we're trying to push right now. And how's it going? Um, tell me, because <laughs> I know there's barriers, there's certainly, you know, middlemen, suppliers who don't want you to succeed because, you know, they're, they're making plenty of money just pushing the stuff on down the line. Um, their distributors, uh, you know, suppliers who are who are skeptical. Um, you you got to deal with people who are used to pen, pencil and paper on the other end who have to be convinced. So, what, where's uh, what's the progress? What's the most encouraging thing that uh, has happened so far? Okay, I would say our main progress here is having these stores download the app and using the app, right? So, so in LATAM, right, you would have 600,000 stores, right? In Colombia, you would have 35,000 stores. And in Colombia alone, we already have 8,000 of, of those 35,000, right? So we're winning over the market, right? We're winning over these guys and these guys are buying through us. What, help, what happens upstream? It's gonna be sort of a consequence of winning over the market, right? These production companies, as I told you, have been winning over distribution companies, right? They haven't, win they haven't been winning over the market. Once we have the market, we go over to the production company and say, guys, I have this amount of consum uh, consumers right, buying through us. You want to be on board, right? And, and they say, no, but what do I do with my distribution channel? I've, no, I've always been selling to these guys. They're going to start 
whatever, no, uh, reducing their, their whatever. And I said, yeah, that's the truth, right? And, and, and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna, you're gonna have to choose tomorrow, sell through tool or sell through your existing channel. And, and if that channel doesn't add value, it's going to start losing ground, right? And, 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 and yeah, so we always have this conversation about going to production companies and then going back to them. And if these guys don't want to be on board, which happens a lot of time, they, they're not easy to move. They don't want to be on board. We say, fine, we'll talk to you in three months. And then we go back to the market and keep on selling. And then we say, guys, now I'm the biggest seller in cement in Ecuador. You want to move your part through me? No, not yet. Okay, fine, we'll keep on selling. So, so what we do here is just, if we're able to solve the needs in the market, I think the rest will just sort of trickle into place, right? And, and obviously these are big companies, you no know, big headquarters companies in Mexico, whatever, huge companies. So guys, I know how big you are, but I have the market in my hands, right? And, and eventually you'll have to turn and eventually you have to see me as an ally and not as a, a competition, right? And, and that's where we're sort of conveying the messages work with us uh, uh, we will help you give you data right i think in the cpg world the coca-cola the kimberleys have based a strategy full of data right they have based a strategy with the nielsen's and a lot of companies just feeding them data these big companies uh, name them how we want they don't have any data right they've been running the market market factory yeah, downward so we tell them guys now we know how your market is buying now we know what happens at two in the morning now what happens at eight in the morning now what, what happens you know if you want to use this data to start improving your SKUs, be my guest. And that's what we bring to the table to that end of the spectrum, right? Just data to those suppliers and helping them, those guys sort of improve their, their SKUs. And some companies have been very sort of bullish in the way they act and they have you not know, created marketing teams to, to understand our data because they have never seen the data before. And just, well, so some companies do, others are more stubborn, but I think it's just a matter of time they fall into place. I mean, that, that tends to be what happens, whether it's ride sharing or, uh, movie and TV streaming or, or what, you know, the old model holds up for a while until the dam breaks. Um, exactly. I, I like to ask a question about what I call Death Valley, uh, lowest point, um, because I find there's often a lot of learning there, le good lessons there and how you got through it. But has there been, what's been the lowest point in this business and entrepreneurial journey where you thought maybe you would hit a wall and you would have to to do something completely different. Has it been a point like that? Yeah, a big one, which was we launched for 1st of March, 2020, you know, and 20 days later, the government said, everything is closed, right? Your market is completely closed. We said, geez, what are we gonna do, right? And, and, and I remember I was back in, in uh, we have this small place in the beach. And my daughter was sort of, wanting a popsicle or whatever and here came this guy with the beach with with sort of selling popsicles so we got the popsicle from, from my daughter and that guy had had a, a small pacifier just tra strapped to his to his thing to his to his bag so why do you have a pacifier and he said no because when 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 the sun and whatever this starts hurting i look down and i see the pacifier i have a newborn in my house and i keep on pushing through the sand right and that sort of clicked me in and said, guys, I cannot, I just started a business two months ago and I cannot stop because of COVID, right? I, I need to pivot. I need to do something. So we went back to the office and we said, guys, first, we cannot stop coming to the office, right? We need to be in the office. We need to see each other's faces. We need to have a, you know, a, a discussion with each other at the table. And we said, let's start calling our customers and call them over and say, hey, John, we, we sold to you, whatever, two times. Uh, I know you're closed. Uh, what can we do for you, right? And and, and then they said, uh, no, I, I I still have some clients which are open. I cannot sell to them. Uh, are you able to sell? And we said, yeah, we're an e-commerce. E-commerce is still open. We can sell. So what we started to do was those guys, those hardware store owners, were selling through their phone, were selling to their friends through their phone. And we were shipping uh, materials across the board, not jumping the store logistically and just shipping across. So. So that was the paper we did. We said we will be able, we, we will ship across, and, and we did it. That sort of held us. So that sort of maintained us through COVID. And then the, the next sort of throft was huge, was Colombia had huge social unrest. I think it was May or, or, or April uh, uh, this year, or 2021. And and no, the market was, was on fire. We were on fire and people were having a bad time. And again, just, sales plummeted and we said what do we do 
And again, going back to the market is the answer. Going back to your client and just ask him. We called, hey, John, it's me again. What do you need? No, I cannot sell anything. They're burning out the trucks in the street. No, no, no. My question to you is, what do you need? Right? And they said, fine, I need diapers. I need rice. I need lentils, whatever. And we bought the, the, the diapers and we shipped across the diapers. And we bought the rice and shipped across the rice. And I think when you have these sort of throw-offs that we'll have 2,000 of those in, in your venture, just go back to your market. I don't go back to a to to a drawing board and try to figure out how to solve COVID in a you know in a, in a, in a no just go back to your clients and say how can I help right I'm here on your side we're all in the same sort of boat facing COVID which no one in the planet has ever faced uh, uh, or in the second time we're on the boat we know that the country is burning up how can I help what do you need and if, and if you can solve those needs in the worst time possible I think that's how you how you win over a market. That's how you, that's how you stay alive, right? If, you, if you're if you stubborn and just arrogant and just keep your way of doing stuff, I think you'll lose. If you if you, if you you lower your sort of your, your, just be humble and just ask the question, what do you need? I think it's easier to just pivot from there. What was the impact on retention, on satisfaction, on reorders after you pursued that strategy of just calling them up and asking what they needed? Yeah, we had around 50% retention and it grew up to around 75% retention in two months after, so after the, the fire settled in and we had business back in place, these guys started to buy. Um, we had average order values, so average the share, of, share of wallet in our clients just grow two or three fold in those clients we impacted, right? So we see those cohorts of those clients that we impacted with that call said, John, what do you want or what do you need? Those clients started buying much from us. Right? So those clients said, and, and it was it was impressive. We have those calls, sort of some, some of those, those calls are written down. And they said, well, it's the first time in my life someone has called me to say, what do you need? It's the first time in my life. I'm a six-year-old guy, and it's the first time in my life someone has called me to say, John, what do you need? How can I help? That simple question. And I think that's that's the impact we're creating. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and we didn't do it just to to sort of create that retention. It was just guys, our clients are in a bad shape right now, not because of them, because of the, you know, their, their 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 externalities. Let's go out and help them, and with whatever we can. That's what we do all the time. Well, isn't that what happens at the street level when these things happen? Exactly. Right? It, isn't it these shop owners who are going to the neighbors who they know, saying, "Well." I know you can't buy construction equipment because the neighborhood's on fire. What do you need? And then their customers are saying diapers, and that's why they told you diapers. Isn't exactly. weren't you exactly. fitting into the culture of the communities that you're serving in the end? Exactly. We did it with, for example, we did it in two cases, which are we remember was COVID started. We called them over. What do you need, John? And they said we want to we want to we want to keep on selling, but our community is sort of no a not dying but it, 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 it's hurting right so 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 we did with minute alliance with a company that did all sort of disinfectants and masks or whatever and we sort of ship those across and we saw we told the communities guys you and your community become that sort of health center and start people coming to your store right and you start giving those guys protection gear or whatever that really helped them out and secondly they said guys the government is sort of uh, writing new laws Every week about COVID, we can we can open, we cannot open. We can what can we do? We don't understand this. So we sort of had these sort of town hall meetings where I and the lawyer of the company sort of talked to them and said, guys, this new sort of uh, this new sort of law uh, allows you to do this, this, and this. You cannot do this. So we sort of helped them sort of convey that message to the community. And yeah, they they sort of trampoline that to their to their own to their own to their own community. So yeah, yeah, we're, we're reading those guys to their community. I think uh, the the camera just got confused about uh, the color because of the white background, but we'll we'll sort of power through. Uh, I, I I often find that whatever it is that gets you through those Death Valley moments becomes a core belief that <laughs> I, I always say a tool in your toolbox uh, that you can continue to use, and I guess that's especially appropriate in this conversation. But uh, you're talking about it, but maybe um, simplify it, condense it. What is the core belief that you have that came out of what you learned getting through that Death Valley experience? 
the core belief is that you need to really if if you hear out your if you hear your market if you hear the if you hear the people talking to you that will let you sort of evolve in your company so my, my biggest message here is in in when you, when you're in the highs of the company i think it's easier to just not do ab testing and do whatever you want to do and just sort of but when you're in these sort of deep holes in the company just shut everything down and have and we did this have the whole company in buses in the street we actually did this we we have we have yeah we have this sort of same because in the, we have, i have this green jacket right now but the the, the jacket that goes in the street is yellow so they call they call us minions in the street so we actually we made minionized sort of the community so we have these people just go to the street and just sit down with a guy and ask him questions if you're able to get those answers back to your to your to your, to your company and to read them out, that's the best advice I can give you. Uh, like 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 yeah, new, new incomers and new new venture guys, is just don't be arrogant. Go to your market, hear them out, and they will give the answers. That's a big sort of the biggest sort of takeaway I have from these sort of thrusts. Wow. Now uh, let's go back and talk about what happens now. Um, are you still raising money, uh, you know, based on where we are now, not just with COVID, but on the kind of cycle of adoption and, and what you've been experiencing? What's your plan? What's your hope for 2022? We have different stage gates, right? So we have cities which are we're opening right now, which are expanding really fast. We, we have now 10 cities, but we should, able to, we should be able to end up 2022 with more than 25 cities in the, in the company. So we're expanding as we speak, putting new flags into new cities. And then the playbook is running, get those people on the street, get those guys to onboard, no, the, the, the playbook. The, the, the others are now in cities that we have much more sort of consolidation with, with, with the hardware, so it's much more sort of share wallet and much more in depth. Now our, our plan is, as I told you, get within the hardware store. Okay? Start, start helping those guys run the business. So, so for the plan for 2022 should be Keep on expanding, open more than 20 cities or 15 cities within within 2022. Get within the hardware store, get within that business, helping run the business with, 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 with a more sort of mature clients, right? And open up Brazil. Brazil is a whole new continent. It's a whole new sort of venture for us. It's an amazing sort of country. Uh, but it's deep. It's 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 it's, it's it has it has its, its its weight, right? It's it's a heavyweight champion. So, so so yeah. I think I think those are the three sort of brackets: expand where we are, get within the hardware store where we sort of uh, have maturity, and conquer Brazil or start putting flags in Brazil. Brazil is huge, and in a way, this reminds me of the ride-sharing uh, playbook. There were so many companies that were creating demand at the customer level for a, a different level of service, for a higher level of convenience, for a higher level of you know payment transparency, and then sort of geographically moving. And the, um, the powers that be in various markets uh, put up a fight. Uh, how is Brazil, as big as that country is, and as big as that market is, characterize the challenge? First, we need to punch first, right? I think it's very important for companies to understand that first mover advantage. We have a huge advantage here in the market. Secondly, I truly believe that Brazil, because of its language barrier with LATAM, acts as a separate market, right? And you, you see it's like LATAM and Brazil, right? They're like two separate things, right? And Brazilians like to deal with Brazilians. It's, it's one of those understanding the culture, be respectful and understand the culture, right? So it's it's a, the first challenge we have is how to build a team which is completely Brazilian, completely autonomous in the way they work, right? Given the tools to that team to be able to deploy the market without sort of a headquarters messing that, uh, that, uh, that venture, right? So we really truly believe Brazil is a new venture within Turi, right? It's not, it's not another country, it's a complete new venture. Before we sort of have this expansion team, no? 
giving the, the, the or launching the country or whatever. Here in Brazil, we have Brazilians understanding their market and launching, launching their market. We also have, we also have a much more sort of tech enabled country, right? So when we get to these stores in Brazil, these guys now know much more about tech, right? It's not the same store we see in Bogota, in Sao Paulo. Now we see sort of store owners, which are much more familiarized with tech. I know it's going to be easier or harder because they have seen what tech can give them. And now they can sort of compare, uh, not in their, their business, but sort of they know what whatever tech can give them. But it's a, it's a difference we have in Brazil, right? Brazil has is a much more tech-enabled country, as you say. Uh, many apps or many, many sort of unicorns have been born in Brazil, different than the rest of Latam. So yeah, I think the challenge there is how to run a team uh, uh, autonomous, alone from the rest of the world, because that's how Brazilians like to like to like to dance. And also how to get to a client whose needs might be higher because he's already been touched by the by the by the tech sort of uh, yeah angle all right well it's a uh, it's a big challenge but you faced them before i look forward to uh, hearing about how it's going uh thanks for sharing so much about tool itself and about your journey as uh co-founder and ceo uh, enrique villamarin uh, i appreciate you joining fort knox thank you thank you thank you for the for the time and thank you for the that yeah, just helped me convey my message thank you <laughs>